Hello there, this is Nick, and welcome to another episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast. Joining me today is Bay Area musician Taylor Vick of Boy Scouts. Boy Scouts just released a new record titled Wayfinder, and it is warm and a little sad and very moving. The perfect pairing for today's book discussion, George Saunders's The Tenth of December. Listen in as Taylor and I talk about the book's use of absurdist mechanisms to move the reader, the connections between Saunders' work and Boy Scouts, and our own attempts to explore new areas of art, despite any existing contextual baggage. That last one, by the way, is just my complicated way of saying that I avoided Saunders for a while because I perceived him to be popular. My mistake. But before we get into the conversation, here's a clip of the new Boy Scouts track, That's Life, Honey. Enjoy. The ocean So I think it's important to note for the listener that this is probably the first in-person episode recording in a year and a half, maybe a year and 10 months, eight months. I don't know, whenever it started. Basically, you're the first. I'm Back. the first. Wow. It's an honor. So I don't know if you're good at human stuff. I'm not sure if I'm good at human stuff anymore. So that's my asterisk and I'm putting on it. Nice. Yeah, same. <laughs> So to start, can you tell me about uh, kind of what role reading has played in your life and, you know, interactions with books and all that good stuff? Yeah, uh, I I always loved reading from when I was a kid. I think I got into, I mean, yeah, like loved it's a lot of children's books, but I also, yeah, loved like fantasy stuff, Chronicles of Narnia and like mm -hmm. Harry Potter, you know, all this stuff was like blowing my mind. <laughs> um, and... Yeah, I think once I kind of got into high school, I took a step back from, I just, it, I, I, it wasn't as, it suddenly became like a required reading mode and I uh, definitely stopped reading for a while. Mm -hmm. But actually, yeah, within the past year, it's kind of, my like love for it is really kind of kept blossomed like, once again, just having so much time to, to actually read. So yeah, it's been a fluctuation. Was there a book that got you back into it? Because I was actually very similar. I Not famously because nobody knows about me. But I told an English teacher in, in high school just some annoying like alternative teenager thing. Like I hate reading. Like I'm never reading. I'm only doing this because you have to. Hmm. And then I think somebody gave me a copy of Catch-22. It was one of my teachers. They're just like, you should read this. Like this is cynical and funny. And like this is how you think. I think you're going to find stuff hmm. in there. So like is there a thing that kind of converted you back Wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm 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 sure there was like after after college or something. I well, for like the most recent kind of resurgence of reading in my life, like in 2020, it was kind of like self help books. <laughs> like I got really into those types of books and like mm -hmm. some more nonfiction stuff like that. And then um, once that just kind of like boosted my just I don't know, made me feel better w about life in general. Then I was like really wanting to to read more fiction and fantasy stuff and so i, I got recommended um this trilogy by nk jemison called the broken earth trilogy mm -hmm. it's like sci-fi and that i was like holy shit i forgot how much i love fiction and just like reading for joy like just pure pleasure and fun or whatever so more recently it was that but i'm sure there were other books along the way that kind of had a similar effect mm -hmm. so the book at hand today george saunders 10th 10th december um, when did you first uh, read this book? How did it come into your orbit? This, my brother recommended me some George Saunders a few like years ago. I, I don't remember exactly the year, but I was actually, I think kind of like, didn't like, I didn't like it at first when I, especially, oh. I think I, I think I looked, I was started reading the first story of this, this, the collection of short stories. And I was like, this is weird. Or like, you know, just totally wrote it off. And then my brother, his name's Travis. He, I think he recommended a short story from his other collection of short stories called In Persuasion Nation. And there's a story called John, I think, just singular guy's name. And that story, once I kind of was just like 
I think I, I maybe revisited it a, while, a couple months or so later, and I was like, oh, this story's crazy. I've never read anything like this. And instead of being kind of like, I've never read anything like this, this is weird and I don't want to, I was like, I actually can't stop. This mm-hmm. is so cool and weird. So I think, yeah, I read that uh, the other short story from the other book first, and then I came back to 10th of December and read that, uh, I don't know, yeah, some four or five years ago or something. Mm-hmm. So you've got a new track on the new record called... That's Life, Honey, which the PR material for it says that <laughs> it has a George Saunders reference. And having read 10th of December now, I'm kind of curious if I can pin the story reference for it. Yeah. So I believe it comes from uh, the uh, the Spiderhead story. Escape from Spiderhead, I believe, is the full title. Is that accurate? I would say that, yes, that is accurate. It's uh, But it's also from that story, John, from the other book, too. Mm. Like, they're similar stories in my in my mind, they have a lot of parallels, but yeah, definitely inspired by both of those, just like science, technology, altering human emotions mm-hmm. and the role that could play or whatever. But yeah, so that was definitely, definitely the inspiration there, but also it was just kind of like coming from my own personal experience of stuff, but also, yeah, I mean, it's both, but yeah, that's, mm-hmm. that's right. That's correct. That story. <laughs> <laughs> good. That makes me feel <laughs> good as an internet sleuth <laughs> Amazing. Uh, <laughs> do you uh do you find that you know when you're writing music and you're kind of pooling from these sources is it a conscious thing like hey oh i've read this short story and man this would be really cool to put into a musical form of some sort or is it more like you're working on music and it just kind of blends in in a way it, it definitely wasn't conscious this time around it kind of was it just kind of naturally or not not that it wouldn't be natural to do it consciously but yeah, I think I just started writing from a personal perspective at first, and then I I don't really even remember the process of writing this song. <laughs> I remember just, yeah, just thinking of the themes of some of his writing and, and um, relating it to my personal experience, and it just kind of seemed to have happened. But now, going forward, I'm like, that would like to make it a more conscious effort, I guess, or just I hadn't really combined the two in my mind, like fiction and songwriting because for me songwriting has always been pretty like autobiographical like just personal Mm -hmm. anecdotes from my life or what i'm whatever i'm going through but now i um yeah it feels very new but it is something i I do want to kind of continue exploring yeah I, i will say the kind of the vibes or the aesthetics of the two your record and 10th of December, and I guess other Saunders books that I read, they kind of fit in my mind. And perhaps it's because I'm reading them like in connection already. Mm. But there's kind of this, um, I don't want to say a sullenness because it's not that, but it's almost like an acceptance of some of the absurdities or the imperfections of life. And it's kind of like, that's all there is, but not in a negative way. It's like, that's that's all there is. And that's, that's the good part. Mm. But it's also the not as good part. And I feel yeah. like- those are the emotions that I've had and are listening to your music recently being like, oh, this actually fits in really well where I'm at in my life of kind of, oh, I guess this is just who I am. Mm-hmm. This is this is what we get and let's make the most of it rather than maybe focusing on some of the, the rough parts. Wow. Yeah, I, I really like that. I, I I like that you've made that connection. I, I, I definitely feel that sometimes just like, I don't know, trying to go about these or just think about events that happen in my life from a more neutral perspective or standpoint. And, and yeah, I don't know, just recognizing that with all of this, you know, the, the bad parts that can happen or bad experiences that I can have, like I, it's just an, an opportunity to practice like acceptance or just like look at it and see like, what can I learn from this and how can I grow? And, and is this, I don't know. Yeah, just just trying to approach things from a no- more neutral standpoint, and yeah, just be like, wow, there it, the the duality of it all is so fascinating and so interesting. And without all of this, all of the negativity, you know, like it's just that that polarity is really important, I think. And yeah, I just can't help but go write about the bad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I think that's you know that's one of the things that Saunders feel like really hits the sweet spot on is. It would be hard to argue that these are happy stories, but they're very funny right. and it can put you in a happy place. But pretty much every single story in this is writing about something. If it's kind of banal, it's not in a positive banal way. And most of the stories are probably much worse than that. Mm-hmm. They're about really 
life-altering shit scenarios and it leaves you with this really confused feeling of laughing a little bit but like hitting you where it hurts the most but then just having to deal with that Mm -hmm. all in pretty compact formats too sometimes 15 pages yeah or even less like there's that one story sticks that's in there it's so short it's not even like two full pages yeah that one um really reminded me uh, so for the listener, we're, we're in my pseudo recording basement dungeon that's just lined with all of my archaic media formats, lots of plastic in here. But that that sticks reminded me essentially of that, mm. of whenever I pass on, somebody's going to take this stuff, and it's going to be their trash, or it's going to be it's going to be trash to them, but it was my treasure. Right. Yeah, right? totally. I also love that like underneath kind of all of the like darkness in his stories and the like really dark kind of like horrifying situations a lot of these characters are in there's just this like innocence to the characters and like they are really you know they seem like people who want to be doing really good it's just such a a fun like I don't know experiment in empathy or something to read read his his stories (laughs) yeah Mm -hmm. yeah that reminds me so I want to read a quote from the Semplica Girl Diaries which I would argue is maybe one of the most trying ones to read for sure And this is written in the form of kind of a journal diary. And I guess the uh, the language of it uh, stands out because it's kind of like notes. It's not really full sentences. And so the, uh, the writer in this case goes, Note to future generations. Sometimes in our time, families get into dark place. Family feels we are losers. Everything we do is wrong. And that, like just a couple of fragmented things, I think encapsulates a lot of what these characters go through, which is just that feeling of the bottom falling out and all of these systems that are infinitely complex that you really can't control. You're just trying to operate within them. Mm, But at some point it breaks you and you just feel crushed. And that I think is very identifiable to, I suspect, most if not every single one of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. He does a really good job of that almost with every story. You're just... I don't know. I, I, I'm all, I've always really been fascinated with that experience of being moved by like a piece of art or, you know, like music or just that experience of having your emotional state shift and just having that kind of, you know, we, I just I'm, I'm living my life as my individual self, Taylor, you know, like I'm just the world revolves around me. Everyone has that kind of experience. But there's still this really beautiful thing that sometimes I don't know just that 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 experience of being moved by something and feeling like wow I feel so connected to what I'm reading or these characters fictional or 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 real and I just find that so fascinating that that is something that can be done and and like what does that mean about like what does that mean for just being a human and and you know living with other humans and relating to the world and to other people and it I just it's like his stories are so strange and it's it's a are the situations that that are happening in the story are really strange and to find myself feeling those feelings Mm -hmm. it's just like addicting i'm like this is so bizarre i feel like so like compassionate and filled with this emotion by while i'm reading this really bizarre (laughs) story yeah it's 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 really cool i just i think he just does such a good job at at that yeah there's a there's a mechanism in here that I've just been kind of thinking about, which is exactly that. These have profoundly weird elements. You mentioned kind of technology, and it's, I wouldn't say sci-fi, right? A lot of it would probably be near future, or this book is written eight-ish years ago. Um, so sometimes it feels like perhaps we're on the cusp right of the present, especially when you get into stories that have mood-enhancing injections and... Uh, and uh, pills and and things that are either employed to people who are not in positions in power or they are uh, workers or they're kind of underlings and you see that it's kind of another step in trying to make the whole quote-unquote system just more efficient Mm -hmm. but he he kind of makes you certain that he's not going to dwell on the technology aspect of it because he gives them dumb names yeah he just makes it silly and he, you know, he throws the trademark thing and he makes compound nouns full of like bad tech startup <laughs> company names, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you just read it and you're like, this is so silly. 
but he's somehow using that to ultimately get to the fact that the point of the story is these human emotions Mm -hmm. that we've had all along. We had them 100 years ago. We're going to have them 100 years in the future. And just his ability to do that, I feel like most of the time we think of stories and fiction that makes us feel things. It's kind of leaning towards the more real, the realism side of stuff. And then things that introduce these fantastical elements are almost more the escapism side. Hmm. So we kind of use them for separate reasons, yeah. which are both important, but they're different flavors. And this, I think, does both somehow and comes out ahead of each. Wow. Yeah, that's. I totally agree with that. I, I hadn't thought about that before, but that it feels so so true it's yeah that's so so cool just in reading his the stuff that he's written I you can just I find that it seems that he's very much how do I say this for example how I when I first came, you know my brother told me to read this book and I looked at it and I was like this is so weird like I, <laughs> this is bizarre I don't want to read this I don't get it like what's happening and then you know later coming back to it and being like wow this is actually so beautiful that it's so different and bizarre just I appreciate that aspect of his writing and how that to me it kind of comes through the the, he's I'm hesitant to say like found his voice but I'm just like (laughs) he has such a specific way of telling story and writing fiction and and sharing it and it just seems like probably to many it it can be kind of off-putting at first but he's I don't know it just seems like he's just writing exactly how he wants to or something you know like Mm -hmm. maybe it's just like this authenticity that I'm recognizing that I think is really just like attractive like I think people like appreciate and recognize authenticity and I don't know he just seems Mm -hmm. to be doing it really well and I appreciate that that he does it (laughs) I think it yeah no I mean that's that's an excellent point I think it it comes out in how accessible it ends up being yeah for things that are both weird and complicated in terms of emotions and resolution. I mean, many of these stories don't really have a uplifting resolution to them. Mm-hmm. They just kind of end up. Um, but his dialogue feels pretty real. Um, his descriptions are not, you know, they're not bombarding you. I feel like that combination of striking something that, like you said, is authentic probably comes from this combo of trying to write like people talk, Mm -hmm. which he nails, but also realizing that this book is entertainment. And like, if people are going to, it's not like he's tricking people into accessing these emotions, but I think there's only a subset of us in the world who seek out dark art that Mm -hmm. makes us like feel bad. Yeah. You know, like things that are purposely difficult. Right. And I don't think that's most people. And I think he kind of walks that line of like giving an entry point and allowing this bizarre, fun slash very empathy heavy material to sneak up on you. Definitely. And that I think is, yeah, like you said, it, it has that authenticity. Like he's not forcing that on anyone. He just kind of just kind of gets it. Yeah, it's super subtle. And like, I mean, probably even the first time I read some of these stories, I wasn't even recognizing kind of how I don't know like you could just read the story and be like wow that was a weird weird story set off in the near future like how bizarre and kind of messed up or whatever and then it it just is so subtle and that how how deep it can actually be or can actually go yeah it's very cool Mm -hmm. there's also I think reading this now and just to be upfront, I'd actually avoided a lot of Saunders stuff up until like a month or two ago Mm -hmm. when we started chatting about this um and I think it's because everybody talks about George Saunders. I mean, like, he's a popular author. I've seen him on, like, late night shows and stuff, right? Yeah. He is one of the probably 10, like, most prominent just voices, I would say. And that, to me, again, probably, like, an alternative teenager thing. I'm still like, no, I'm, I'm going to avoid it, right? right. I'm going to look for the other stuff. But when I started digging into this stuff, it reminded me, especially after the last however many years of politics, which have felt like, you know, centuries, that there's this window into other worlds that maybe some of us don't have everyday interactions with. Mm -hmm. There's uh, the story Home in this, which is basically a veteran comes back and he's greatly suffering and he's trying to insert himself back into a life of some sort. Um, But his family has schisms, you know, uh, 
his uh, his kids and I'm not sure if it was his ex-wife or just partner, but it basically have moved on. And there's sort of no space for him anymore. And um, that's not a type of character or um, person in my normal interactions of life. And I found myself reminded of, not to put this too grandiosely, but kind of the vastness of where we live, mm -hmm. like both as a country and as a, as a world, right? Yeah. And so often, you know, we, we kind of get into our holes and a lot of this is exacerbated by all of the technology around us, all that stuff. But this kind of reminded me of all of the other pressures on people, all of the other down forces, and that, you know, pretty much we all have a different combination of them, but everybody's challenged with something. Hmm. And that was really kind of an important thing for me too. Not that I feel like I'm completely disconnected from that concept, but it was just a good reminder of remember that compassion for, for other people. Mm -hmm. And to try to figure out where they're at and where they're coming from, because it's not always this clean thing. Yeah, I think that is yeah another thing he does so well, and another thing that is just always been fascinating to me. Like I remember being being younger and just being like I would like obsessively think about what it would be like to be someone else, or to just like tr really try so hard and just keep coming to that same end of like. I will only ever actually really know my experience as Taylor and it's just so mind blowing to just kind of imagine how it feels to be in someone else's body and like they're having that same kind of experience of like they only know themselves and yeah when it's just it is that's just such a such a cool thing about fiction and and art in general but yeah so I guess specifically storytelling is you really get it's kind of like the closest you can get <laughs> to to reading or hearing understanding the perspective of somebody other than you and it's like in in his writing he often is it, it shifts between different perspectives sometimes throughout the story and you're just like in that character's head and then next thing you know you're in the other person's head and and then of course all of these are fictional and and even i mean it's like i'm actually reading through there's another like lens there of being from George Saunders imagination and stuff so it's not even you know but mm -hmm. it is a really fascinating practice and yeah I like the extra yeah kind of what you said of kind of envisioning what other people's lives are but also kind of the personal fantasy aspect which he did a couple times with a couple characters Al Rustin uh, that story um, the kid in the uh, title story 10th of December and it was almost really reassuring for me to read these fictional characters that were involved in their own fictions and mm -hmm. that was the thing that helped them get by and helped justify mm -hmm. and in the case of the Al Roosten story the thing that actually kind of got away from him mm -hmm. shows that some of the dangers of that mm -hmm. but knowing that you know other people have that voice that's running in their head all the time that's either trying to you know uh, obscure how not great their own life is or to just kind of I don't know, deal with some of the, the the challenges and the pain that they're they're going through. Yeah. And he does that again in a super fun way. It's like you almost want to laugh, not even not at the character, but with them. It seems mm -hmm. fun. But it comes from this place of, you know, in the last story, Tenth of December, the kid basically has no friends. He's having this imaginary conversation with a, a girl that he wants to be involved with. Mm -hmm. And she just thinks he's a hero and all this stuff. But the sad part is is it's just entirely in his head. Mm-hmm. So part of me is just like, oh, cool, other people do that. Totally, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think we all do. Uh, is there a, because you had mentioned kind of the connection to these stories and making you you feel uh, fictional characters, but feels very real. Is there a character or a story that that stands out to you that has that biggest connection? I don't know if it's like super fucked up to relate so much to this character. <laughs> okay, here but... we go, here we go. <laughs> um... <laughs> No, I, I, I think from the escape to from Spiderhead story, just the that the main guy I can't remember his name now. You know, the main dude who's getting like injected with. Yeah, they they have the experimental drugs. He comes to this. Well, I don't. I don't want it to be like spoiler. Yeah, mode. that's okay. <laughs> if people are made it to minute thirty, they know what they're getting. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's basically faced with that. I mean, I don't even know why. I, I just I, when I read this story, I was like. When I when he chose to do what he chose to do and and kind of like sacrifice his own life for 
for this other woman who's in an equally fucked up situation. I just, I loved, I mean, it's such a dark, such a dark story, really good. There was something that really resonated with me in that story. Um, and I, I, I don't even know exactly <laughs> what it is, but I will think about that story probably forever. Uh, one of my quotes that I had spiked out comes at the end of it. Uh, I want to read part of it because I feel like the old question of nature versus nurture, are we created good or evil? I feel like Saunders' take on this is, is perfect. And after listing a group of people involved in the story, he says, At birth, they've been charged by God with the responsibility of growing into total fuck-ups. Had they chosen this? Was it their fault as they tumbled out of the womb? Had they aspired, covered in placental blood, to grow into harmers, dark forces, life-enders? In that first holy instant of breath-slash-awareness, tiny hands clutching and unclutching. Had it been their fondest hope to render, via gun, knife, or brick, some innocent family bereft? No, and yet their crooked destinies had lain dormant within them, seeds awaiting water and light to bring forth the most violent, life-poisoning flowers. Said water-slash-light actually being the requisite combination of neurological tendency and environmental activation that would transform them, transform us, into earth's awful murderers and foul us with the ultimate unwashable transgression. That's, I mean, I actually think that's the best paragraph of the whole book, in my opinion. Yeah. Wow. So. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. It's, that story is just incredible. I love that that story kind of deals or um, suggests the idea that humans can change in a really, uh, you know, mm -hmm. like this, he's in, it's basically like a prison facility center. He's a, he's a, yeah, committed murder and by the end of the story has just, you know, he's almost a completely new person. I mean, I guess we don't really get that before. It's just, you know, implied, but we get a, li a little bit of background of his his history and stuff. And yeah, I love, I love that um, there's all these things in, in his stories that he's like, doesn't actually talk about, but are just, you just can gather from the story. And I don't know, it's, it's so cool. And, and I did really enjoy that, that yeah, this character who had done a bunch of horrible shit before is now still in a very hard, terrible situation and does something wildly different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's amazing. So yeah. Good. And that last, so the, sentence or two that comes after that to wrap up the story basically references the fact that earlier in the story in order to emote to basically speak with with some level of eloquence or or uh feeling they had to be injected with i believe it was verba loose mm. or something <laughs> and so the end of that comment that he makes says oh and i didn't even need mm. verba loose mm -hmm. to be able to access those things yeah. and so yeah it basically does exactly what you said it hints at this this change that did occur. Mm -hmm. What a story. What a paragraph. Yeah. Especially, I feel like I, I didn't I didn't tag that many quotes because I feel like with a lot of Saunders, it's almost some of the some of the impact is is the the funniness of it or like the little quips and things like that. He doesn't really have a lot of the big uh, official statements that you might find in some other fiction. Mm -hmm. um, but when he does lock into it. You're like, oh, he's, yeah, you know how to do that too. <laughs> totally, yeah. <laughs> it's funny what you were saying earlier about putting off reading his work for, for as long as he did just because there was all the, you know, the buzz about it. And I wonder if I would have done the same thing. I, I, I didn't know anything about him or I had no idea that he was, I, I didn't, I just, I don't know. Yeah, I hadn't even read like, a, I hadn't really been into short stories. I was really like kind of against those in general so but it's just I don't know I'm curious how you feel about about him now having familiarized yourself with it more or if that's like are you kind of like oh it makes sense that everyone you know like reveres him as this like literary fiction god or or are you kind of like it's a little bit overrated or what are your criticisms of it oh criticisms yeah uh so I guess in addition to 10th of December and Civil War Land and Bad Decline. I think I'd read his essays a little while ago, uh, Brain Dead Megaphone. And then I also read uh, Lincoln and the Bardo, his kind of his, his novel that got a lot of acclaim. And I've arrived at, yeah, I think the, I think the praise is worthy. I think it's, I think it's real. And my own personal struggles with, with art is that I still, I'm forever trying to shake this, but like, I think when you consume new art, it's hard to shake 
or sorry, it's hard to isolate it from the context in which it exists. And sometimes context of art is very important, but I kind of like to try to just see if I like things. Mm -hmm. And I've been getting better at that rather than reading something to try to prove that it does or does not fit into whatever category that I think it might. Mm. So that's my own sort of personal like, you know, gears turning that I'm trying to like turn off as I get older. Mm -hmm. Um, And when I do that, I find that, yeah, this is actually, this is great stuff. Like I think there's a reason why some authors just have it. Um, And he's definitely improved having read like some stuff off of a off of a, um, a timeline. I do think he's kind of getting into, especially with like Lincoln and the Bardo, he's trying to figure out form stuff a little bit more. Um, and part of me is like, don't push it too far. Mm-hmm. Because like, you know, I used to love, you know, books that were so experimental that they were just hard to read. I feel like that's a very common thing for people in their 20s to like have some sort of faux intellectual weight to them. I'll happily put myself in that category, unfortunately. <laughs> but now I kind of think of things. I still like the flourishes. I still I love the mechanisms. I love the absurdism. I love that stuff. I think it's what makes him. Mm-hmm. But if those become too big, then you you risk losing some of that empathy, some of that emotional stuff. Mm-hmm. So you don't need as many fireworks. You need the right amount of fireworks. Yeah, yeah. And I think I've I feel like I've read some criticism um just about him cracking too many jokes <laughs> or just being like too funny in really <laughs> dark moments but i actually really like that i feel it i yeah i wouldn't say it's too much or anything i don't know i i'm also like yeah i enjoy that kind of just laughing at a moment that maybe you shouldn't be laughing but i don't know yeah i think it, it's he's he seems like a funny guy <laughs> yeah i mean i think you know humor is a great coping mechanism mm-hmm um, it's kind of how I approach things in my own life. So even though I love, love serious art, right? I mean, I'll happily watch whatever dark film where there's no jokes and give me a long book where it's just about how everything's meaningless. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm down. That sounds great. Um, but it, whenever I make something, it's got jokes in it. Yeah. Like I can't, I can't like think of myself in this like full blown melancholy way. Right. No matter how many black shirts I own and stuff. Like it's all just <laughs> still a little bit fun. Yeah. And I think uh, finding that like combination has resonance for me. Hmm. It's just proof that like you don't have to avoid stuff, right? For me, like, yeah, obviously Joy Division is great. My Bloody Valentine's great. Like Yola Tango, like all these big things that mm-hmm. that for the longest time I'd be like, no, I'm only listening to this kind of music that's outside these established popular things. Mm-hmm. But then eventually you check it out. These are good things too. Yeah. So what's the point? What are we trying to prove? Read right. George Saunders. He's fantastic. And it's like, well, I, why why deprive myself of like a, something that I could potentially really love just because of the everybody else already loving it? Yeah. I think what uh, that's a really cool practice that you were talking about of just as far as, yeah, just trying to like listen to something or to, to, I thought of it in relation to music, like just trying to hear an artist or a band or something for the first time without separating it from the like context of the cultural buzz or whatever Mm -hmm. or even just like even just like the i don't know i guess sharing recommendations with friends is different it's like oh i my my brother and i like similar music so i probably assume i will like what he sends me but yeah more so with the separating from the the other stuff the cultural how how many followers they have or whatever just like trying to really just listen to it and and see how it how it moves you without all that other stuff in mind is uh, really seems to take effort. Yeah, and I think I think it's funny. I think before all of our lives were governed by algorithms, that we were sort of doing the same behaviors anyway. Like mm-hmm. you mentioned, like getting recommendations from friends. Like if I get a recommendation from one friend, I always know that it's going to fit into this category of myself. Mm-hmm. Versus this other connection I have with somebody else might recommend a thing that fits into this other other category of myself. Mm-hmm. And I like both things, but I don't know if they would like the individual things, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so I feel like it's inevitable. It's sort of impossible to try to get around. Mm-hmm. Like how do you how do you free yourself from that dependency and contingencies of where these things come from? And more often than not, I find that if I just try to like throw myself out into some sort of, you know, stranded area of things I'm not familiar with, and as long as you spend time with it, there's good stuff there. Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. this happens with music all the time, certainly fiction. Mm-hmm. You know, like there's a reason why why people like this stuff. 
but it's still it's hard for me i think we all all operate off of comforts and Mm -hmm. you know we like certain chord progressions we like certain guitar sounds you know you're either a reverb or a distortion person (laughs) so that's like defined at birth yep oh yeah they write it on your birth certificate (laughs) (laughs) so other than george saunders and other quarantine reading uh is there anything else from this accessing art standpoint that has been important to you maybe outside of what you normally do i don't know anything Mm. hidden you know i don't i've been listening to i don't know podcasts and audiobooks (laughs) and just going on really long walks like has been a new thing for me that's been i don't know pretty revolutionary just having like some kind of routine even if it's just one or two things every day has been great. I've been really into going on a walk and listening to something at the same time. And yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm also like trying to get into movies, which sounds so ridiculous, <laughs> but I'm one of those people that has gone throughout most of life, not seeing a lot of all the movies that everyone else has already seen. Mm. Yeah, I guess those are those are two <laughs> two things that I have been doing more than anything else probably is like just listening listening to stuff journaling going on walks trying to watch movies getting overwhelmed by the amount of content that is out there but yeah just trying to i don't know stay inspired i'm like i feel like i'm like collecting all the inspiration now and not creating anything just kind of like absorbing Mm -hmm. and um yeah, that's that's where I, where I'm at these days. <laughs> yeah, I feel like yeah, in pandemic lessons, like the walk thing is great, and even like maybe even experiencing in extra levels of depth, like the environment that was always around you, but you were too busy mm-hmm. ping pong in between places. That's been one of my things. But I, I think the the space that can come with that too, like if you're going on a walk and you're you were listening to something, whether it's a record or a podcast, you're actually giving it some level of attention perhaps undivided attention yeah which feels nice i feel like there was a little bit of reset in not being as fragmented that comes with that i'm reading this book called the listening path or something i think it's by the woman who wrote the artist's way um and it's kind of all about that i mean i've I've just just begun it but it's about um really being really intentional with our attention and um Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something that I really, I think what I love more than actually being on a walk is just that act of like really listening. It, I mean, I guess it is still multitasking, but it's so different than like being like on your laptop and listening to something, you know, it's like you can just autopilot, be walking in a beautiful area and also be taking in something else. Um, yeah, and just playing with that, like that intentional uh, attention where, yeah, I don't mm-hmm. know, being really present and walks right now is the, the best way that I <laughs> can access that. So to anyone who's listening to this while walking, wow. we support that activity. Yes, we this do. This is for you. This is for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much for hanging out and uh, actually propelling me to read more Saunders. Um, I feel like I've been putting that off for a long time. So this was great in terms of motivation. Cool. Uh, so I appreciate the time. I appreciate all the insight. This is a lot of fun. Oh my God. Yeah. Thank you. It's it's really cool. It's not often that I talk about books really. I'm, I'm inspired to be joining a book club, starting one. There you who go. Knows? Now you can just find strangers who like books. Yeah. Then, I mean, there's got to be a lot of them. I think there's a couple. <laughs> Amazing. Well, yeah. Thank <laughs> you for having me. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for listening. You can find out more about Boy Scouts at boyscoutsband.com. Their new release, Wayfinder, is available now from Anti Records. It is extremely good, and I can personally say that it has been very helpful recently in getting me through some of my own real-life absurdist situations. So thanks for that, Taylor. You can find out about us at booksofsomesubstance.com and on Instagram and Twitter with the handle booksosubstance. Until next time, happy reading. <laughs>